Heavy rains are causing flooding across central and southern China. Chinese officials activated a level three emergency response. They warn of high-risk storms, flooding and landslides. Beijing recently appointed a hardline communist official from mainland China as head of a new powerful security agency in Hong Kong. This official is known for his harsh crackdown on an anti-corruption protest in China 10 years ago. British broadcasting watchdog Ofcom says China's state-run broadcaster CGTN severely violated British broadcasting rules. This after the station aired the forced confession of a UK citizen. U.S. Navy aircraft carriers USS Nimitz and USS Ronald Reagan are conducting exercises in the contested South China Sea and reports that Confucius Institutes will be changing its name. The facilities have come under fire for pushing the Communist Party's ideology and propaganda worldwide. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. One law professor in Beijing named Xu Zhangren has been taken away by the police. His arrest comes after publishing articles online that criticize the Chinese regime. A friend of his, Ms. Zhen, told us that Professor Xu was detained on accusations of consorting with prostitutes. But Ms. Zhen said the claim is vile and slanderous and said it's being used in an attempt to discredit him. She called the Communist Party shameless. Chinese authorities have also used similar charges to silence other regime critics. Professor Xi is one of the few prominent Chinese scholars who dare to speak out against the party. He completed his doctorate at the University of Melbourne in Australia and later taught at Tsinghua University in Beijing, a prestigious school attended by Chinese leader Xi Jinping and many other CCP officials. In his previous articles, Professor Xi dared the CCP to uncover the truth about the origin of the CCP virus and find the true number of cases in China. Officially named the Day of Dr. Li Wenliang as China's Day of Freedom of Speech, dissolve internet police groups that monitor social media, disband the Communist Party's organizations inside companies, schools, colleges and other institutions, and release detained citizen journalists, lawyers, leaders of spiritual groups and others who have been suppressed due to their fight against injustice. Professor Xi once said to rule by using people as tools is more toxic than any virus. Floods have been drenching 70 percent of Chinese provinces. Among them are important areas for agriculture, raising concerns over food supplies and production. According to one document, the southwestern Chinese city of Chengdu requested that farmers begin rice planting in the orchards and tree plantations in an effort to respond to the possible flood crisis. The city's authorities told nonprofit broadcaster Radio Free Asia that the move is nationwide. The benefits of planting fruit trees far exceed those of growing grain. The compensation provided to farmers also differs by region. In some areas, the benefits are even too little to cover the base cost for growing grain. In addition, the Chinese regime recently put the troop reserves mobilized by the local government under the command of the Central Military Commission. Speculation is rising that Xi Jinping is beginning food and war preparations. That's as the Chinese regime seems to view all Western countries as enemies to China. This idea is a decades-old one and came from former Chinese leader Mao Zedong during a time when China completely closed its doors to the Western world. Torrential rain and thunderstorms are battering central and southern China. Many roads are damaged and submerged, and authorities are issuing raised flood alerts. Heavy rainfall in China has led to rising water levels in Shizhou County, in the country's southwest. The swift floodwaters broke the construction scaffolding of the local dam and flowed over onto the road. Nearly 40 homes were flooded. In another village, two residents were swept away by the floodwaters. Local rescue workers reached the trapped residents and pulled them out with ropes. Central China's most populous city, Wuhan, raised this flood alert by two levels. It also upgraded its emergency flood response to level two, the second highest in its four-tier scale. Several other places in the same province, Hubei, issued 75 rainstorm warnings on Monday. Another city in Hubei used more than 20 heavy-duty vehicles to repair a section of road damaged by the flood. Chinese authorities issued rainstorm warnings for more than a month and raised their emergency response level. The alert covers the entire coastline of the Yangtze River Basin, including five other lakes and a river. 
Torrential rains continue to batter China from the southwest to the east coast. The provinces of Zhejiang, Anhui, and Jiangsu all declared yellow alerts, with Shanghai topping the list. Flood water damaged several sections of road in several provinces. In a city in Anhui province, flooding pummeled a local road, creating a gap of about 26 feet wide, making it impassable. The local government deployed police to persuade passing vehicles to return. Chinese officials say rainfall in June was nearly 15 percent higher than usual. While there were 50 percent more June rainstorms and thunderstorms than the average in the last three years. The South China Sea is seeing increased military presence from the U.S. as China's dominance in the region has steadily grown. Two Navy carriers and a B-52 bomber made their presence known over the weekend. Two U.S. Navy aircraft carriers are conducting exercises in the contested South China Sea. The commander of one of the carriers, the USS Nimitz, said the carriers are within sight of Chinese naval vessels. Rear Admiral James Kirk said they have seen us and we have seen them. The carrier, along with the USS Ronald Reagan, began conducting the flight drills on July 4th. China's foreign ministry said this was a deliberate maneuver for the U.S. to flex its muscles. The Pentagon described the 100,000-ton ships and the 90 or so aircraft they carry as a symbol of resolve. The intent is to stand up for the right of all nations to fly, sail and operate wherever international law allows. China claims nine-tenths of the resource-rich South China Sea. But Brunei, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan and Vietnam have competing claims. The contested waters not only contain the resources of fish, gas and oil, but also some $3 trillion worth of global trade passes through each year. China has built island bases atop reef islands in the region. Its military staging exercises in the surrounding waters over the last five days. This claim to the area angered the Philippines. Chinese maritime officials are prohibiting all vessels from navigating within this area. According to the Air Force, the U.S. also sent a B-52 bomber to train with jets from the aircraft carriers Reagan and Nimitz in the South China Sea. The U.S. Strategic Command sent the bomber to demonstrate commitment to the security and stability of the Indo-Pacific region. As relations remain tense between India and China, other Southeast Asian countries are weighing in. In a rare move, Myanmar, also known as Burma, is now calling out the Chinese regime for providing support to insurgent groups in the country. Myanmar's military commander-in-chief said last week that terrorist groups exist because of support from strong forces. Many believe the reference hinted at China. A spokesman for Myanmar's military later expanded on the comment. He said that terror groups referred to the Arakan Army and Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. Both are classified as terrorist groups by Myanmar's government. The spokesman added that the terror groups employ weapons supplied by the Chinese regime, something China denies. According to reports, China has long been accused of supporting the terror groups in hopes of easier implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative. That would give Beijing entry into a geostrategically important location, as Myanmar sits between China and India and has a wealth of natural resources. On the other hand, Pakistan has also chosen a side. Its silence amid the India-China border conflict has not gone unnoticed. Pakistan has long been a vocal supporter of the Chinese regime. Pakistan's army has also benefited from the billions China has poured into it. But now Pakistan faces a choice, review its China policy or face isolation alongside China. The country is already facing backlash for its support. The EU banned Pakistan International Airlines from landing in Europe. The company is said to appeal the decision. Resentment inside Pakistan is also building, particularly in the largest province. Locals are furious over the way China has handled natural resources there. Under the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, a $62 billion investment China made in Pakistan, akin to the Belt and Road Initiative. And British broadcasting watchdog Ofcom says China's state-run broadcaster CGTN severely violated British broadcasting rules. That's after the station aired the forced confession of a UK citizen. Peter Humphrey is a former journalist and private investigator in China. He was jailed for over two years in Shanghai in 2014. Humphrey says he was falsely accused and his confession was obtained under coercion. 
Ofcom stated CGTN's airing of the confession violated fairness and privacy rules and called it a serious breach of its code of conduct. CGTN is likely to face sanctions and hefty fines and may even lose its broadcast license in the UK. The ruling may also escalate diplomatic tensions between the UK and China. CGTN is the English language channel of the Communist Party's media mouthpiece CCTV. The US designated CGTN as foreign missions and not a media. Mercedes-Benz announced a recall of more than 660,000 vehicles in China over possible oil leaks. Most of the vehicles in question were made in China. A seal between a high-pressure fuel pump and a low-pressure fuel pump could weaken over time, causing oil leaks in cold weather. Of the over 660,000 vehicles recalled, 36,000 were imported. This follows an earlier recall for incorrect child safety lock labels and imported Mercedes sedans. This recall includes vehicles made between February 2013 and June 2017. It will begin December 18th. Faulty parts will be replaced free of charge. Following Beijing's draconian security law going into effect in Hong Kong, some politically sensitive books have started disappearing from the city's public libraries. Some books written by prominent pro-democracy activists like Joshua Wong and Tanya Cheng are now unavailable in Hong Kong libraries. A government department said the books are being reviewed to see if they violate the new security law. The sweeping law was imposed less than a week ago. It punishes secession, subversion, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces, according to Beijing's definition. Convicted violators may face life in prison. The same day Beijing passed the law, Hong Kong's pro-democracy activists began to quit their posts. Demo Sisto, a pro-democracy party, announced on Twitter it will disband and seize all operations as a group given the circumstances. That says Nathan Law, a co-founder of the party and a leading young democracy activist, has fled Hong Kong. He didn't reveal his whereabouts but said he will continue his advocacy from abroad. Another prominent activist, Joshua Wong, chose to stay in the city despite the risks and his belief that he will be targeted by Beijing's law. Before a court appearance this Monday, Wong said he hopes more people will continue to engage in the democracy movement. With the belief of Hong Kong people to fight for freedom, we will never give up and surrender to Beijing. Wong was in court for a protest outside police headquarters last year. He and two other fellow activists are charged with inciting, organizing and participating in unlawful assembly. Wong pleaded not guilty. His fellow activist Agnes Chow admitted two charges. The first person charged under the new security law was denied bail on Monday. The 23-year-old was accused of riding into a group of police officers on a motorcycle with a flag that said, Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution of Our Times. Hong Kong government has declared the slogan illegal, and anyone using the slogan risks being prosecuted under the new security law. The man was charged with terrorism and incitement of separatism. He is now in police custody. Despite early signs of censorship, Hong Kongers are finding ways to skirt the ban. Dozens of demonstrators got together in a lunchtime protest, raising blank pieces of white paper to avoid slogans under the new security law. These slogans will always be in my heart, and those words will always stay on white paper, which will never disappear. They can silence us, create white terror, and let us censor ourselves, but our heart will never die. The new security law is sending a ripple effect. Major tech companies are refusing user data requests from Hong Kong law enforcement as they evaluate the new security law. This includes Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter and Telegram. And Canada is suspending its extradition treaty with Hong Kong. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said they're also looking at additional measures, including around immigration. The Chinese regime recently appointed a communist official to direct its new national security office in Hong Kong. Concerns are rising that it will be used to quash the city's pro-democracy movement. The new agency leader is famous for his hardline clampdown on a previous anti-corruption protest in China. 
Beijing has appointed a tough-talking communist official from mainland China to lead a powerful new security agency in Hong Kong. The agency is being set up according to Beijing's recently passed draconian national security law, which criminalizes dissent in Hong Kong. According to the law, the agency answers directly to Beijing and isn't constrained by local laws in Hong Kong. The agency also has the power to send suspected lawbreakers to court in mainland China for trial. The official heading the agency, Zheng Yanxiong, was formerly the Communist Party secretary for the southern province of Guangdong. Zheng has no experience in Hong Kong affairs, but he is famous for and was promoted because of his hardline crackdown 10 years ago on Wukan village. That's where local protests against corruption was quashed with riot pleas and mass arrests. At one time, the village directly elected its own local leader and was seen as a symbol of China's grassroots democracy, but the efforts were later crushed by the bloody crackdown. One of Zheng's comments went viral at the time, where he criticized the villagers for colluding with foreign media to create trouble. He said much as the villagers might have hoped bad press on the protests would get him fired, it wouldn't happen. The villagers were trying to find a few reporters to sensationalize the crackdown. The worse the media reports are about it, the happier the villagers will be. And they think, I will be in trouble, my boss will get anxious and fire me. What good would it do them if I was fired? Even if officials send another party secretary, he would not necessarily be any better than me, Zheng Yangxiong. Pigs will fly before the foreign press can be trusted. One former protest leader from Wukan village, Zhuang Liehong, now lives in the U.S. He posted a banner on Twitter that reads, Wukan yesterday, Hong Kong today, indicating that the party official might take the same harsh approach with Hong Kongers now as he did then in mainland China. Penny Zhou, NTD News. The U.S. is considering further measures against Beijing over Hong Kong. The U.S. Council General of Hong Kong says it's the result of Beijing treating the region like part of the mainland. The U.S. Consul General of Hong Kong in Macau says further measures are under review to build on concrete steps already taken against Beijing. Uh, it's very important for us uh, to highlight the fact that to the extent that uh, mainland China starts treating Hong Kong more like the mainland, uh, then the way we treat uh, Hong Kong has to reflect that uh, as well. The U.S. has already begun eliminating Hong Kong's special status halting defense exports and restricting the territory's access to high-technology products. Speaking in a radio interview with local broadcaster RTHK, Hans Kam Smith said this was about Beijing not honoring an agreement that was already in place. Uh, as I said before, simply let Hong Kong be Hong Kong. Hong Kong returned to Chinese rule in 1997 on the condition that the city's autonomy would be preserved, including an independent legal system. Smith said the steady erosion of Hong Kong's autonomy culminated with Beijing imposing its draconian national security legislation on the region last week. Chinese Vice Premier Han Zheng made assurances that the new law will only target a small group of people. It's a claim disputed by pro-democracy activist Joshua Wong, who says it's affecting the daily life of Hong Kongers. Even they ban my book in public library, they can't ignore and silence the voice of Hong Kong people. Wong said the new law is being used as an excuse for censorship. A search of the online database for the city's public libraries recently revealed that books written with pro-democracy content had been removed or were unavailable. Hong Kong's authorities have already made arrests under the new law. Germany will lead the European Union for the next half a year. One of their goals is a more concerted response to the CCP's transgressions. NTD's Germany correspondent Christian Watchin has more on this. Germany just assumed the rotating six-month-long presidency of the EU. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said one focus will be China. Merkel is stressing that Europe needs to speak with one voice if it wants to successfully deal with an increasingly assertive China. According to observers, the Chinese Communist Party has been employing divide-and-conquer tactics in Europe. It works to break countries out of the alliance so that it can deal with them one-on-one -on -one in an uneven relationship. So we have to tell them, that is beyond your powers. Germany could not do that alone. Other EU states can't do that alone either. In this respect, this appeal to speak with one voice is the most important systematic approach for the European presidency. 
After the Chinese regime imposed its so-called national security law on Hong Kong last week, the EU warned of serious consequences. Europeans are concerned the law will undermine the city's autonomy, rule of law, and freedom. Now the bloc is mulling over what those consequences could look like. While the European Parliament calls on the member states to file a case before the International Court of Justice, others in Europe also favor sanctions against Chinese officials. Some say the EU needs to remember the significance of its own economic weight, since China may need the European market even more than the reverse. When China if China cannot make use of the largest economic area in the world, namely the European Union, and cannot massively export to it, China's domestic, economic and political problems will increase. While China is the EU's second biggest trading partner behind the United States, the EU is China's biggest trading partner. Supporters stress that a coherent and impactful response toward China needs to include Europe's allies too. I advocate that Europe and the United States act together and do not develop a China strategy on their own, but that they define shared interests and try to implement them with shared means. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and European Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Burrell last month agreed to a distinct bilateral dialogue focusing on China. There's also a growing alliance outside the governments that don't always see eye to eye. Brand is co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, an international group of legislators. They're similarly pushing for a stronger, more concerted line on China. When we are not ourselves, if we do not want to see our freedoms and liberties threatened even more because China's approach is global, then we also need a joint response and coordination among the friends of freedom and human rights. Merkel and the EU leaders vow to more robustly defend Europe's interests and universal values in the face of the Chinese regime's authoritarianism. Reporting by Christian Watchian, NTD News, Berlin. Confucius Institutes will reportedly be changing its name. The facilities came under scrutiny for promoting the Chinese Communist Party's ideology. The CCP faced a backlash for trying to further its propaganda worldwide. A directive issued by the Chinese Ministry of Education suggests Confucius Institutes will be renamed the Center for Language Exchange and Corporation. In our recent special report, Manipulating America, we explained how the CCP has tried to use Confucius Institutes to infiltrate U.S. society. The CCP has opened 541 Confucius Institutes in over 100 countries around the world. About 15 percent of them are in the United States, the largest number in any one country. In the United States alone, the Chinese Communist Party has invested at least 158 million in Confucius Institutes, including startup and operating costs, teacher salaries, and teaching materials. The money comes from Hanban, the supervising body of the Confucius Institute, which is under the Ministry of Education of the CCP. The Chinese government reserves to itself the right to veto any course, materials, or programs. So think of this, this is a foreign government telling a college or university what it can or cannot teach on its own campus. Rochelle Peterson, policy director of the National Association of Scholars, visited 12 Confucius Institutes in the United States to conduct a case study. But none of the American universities were willing to show her their contract with Hanban. After she filed Freedom of Information Act requests, she got eight contracts and understood why the CCP wanted to keep them secret. The contract terms include, Chinese employees of Confucius Institutes, even in the United States, must obey the laws of the Chinese Communist Party. Hanban has the right to evaluate the performance of Confucius Institute teachers in the United States. American universities and employees must not tarnish the reputation of the Confucius Institute. Otherwise, all cooperation and funding will be terminated. The purpose is to signal to colleges and universities what kind of behavior is desired by the Chinese government and what kind of behavior is necessary to maintain the financial benefits of having a close relationship with China. With the Confucius Institute as the outpost, the CCP has provided various grants to American universities that host Confucius Institutes, sent thousands of Chinese students who pay full tuition 
and invited American university administrators to travel to China for free. When I spoke to um, American college professors who were at universities with Confucius Institutes, they felt that pressure coming down on them from their deans and from their provosts. They feel that pressure to watch what they say, uh, both because the Chinese government is listening, but also because their university is listening and their university wants to maintain that, uh, that flow of money coming from China. In addition, Hanban's hiring practices have been found to include provisions that discriminate against certain faiths. This is completely contrary to American law and values. The Chinese Communist Party has wiped out the traditional Chinese culture in mainland China. Instead, it has replaced the traditional culture with the Communist Party's culture. So the cultural exchange is actually exporting the Communist Party's culture to the world. The CCP culture is contrary not only to American values, but also to the universal values of the world. If this cultural exchange is accepted unwittingly, it is actually helping the CCP undermine American values. A new report claims the spread of the CCP virus in New York nursing homes was related to infections among staff. The state's Department of Health issued the report, which contradicts earlier claims that infection spread after residents returned to the homes from the hospital. A report from the New York Department of Health claims the reason why so many died in the state's nursing homes from the CCP virus was because of infected staff. The report states most patients who were admitted to nursing homes from hospitals were no longer contagious with the virus when they were admitted. But the central point of the presentation is that those who claim that nursing home admission policy from hospitals caused the fatalities is not supported by the facts. On March 25th, New York Governor Cuomo ordered that nursing homes could not deny readmission to residents from hospitals just because they had the virus. Many suspected Cuomo's order was the reason for the deaths, but this report contradicts that claim. But it's important to remember that sometimes, sometimes what happens is that a narrative gets perpetuated when it's not based on facts. Uh, and that narrative, that story gets swept away as the, as the truth, simply by virtue of repetition, whether because of a uh, lack of critical thinking or because of malice. Either way. Cuomo's order has since been removed from the state's website. New York Assembly member Ron Kim is a critic of the state's nursing home policies. The New York Post reports that Kim said, this is a conflict of interest for the health department to investigate its own poor decisions, and that this is part of the beginning of a cover-up for their poor decisions. The number of infected nursing home staff reached its peak 23 days before the most nursing home residents died in a single day. Therefore, the report says the two are correlated. The data bears out another possibility. The death rate skyrocketed immediately after Cuomo's order to let infected nursing home residents return. The highest number of deaths in nursing homes happened two weeks after his order. Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York. A doctor known for touting his triple ingredient therapy for the CCP virus has published another study showing positive results. This as the WHO discontinues its study on one of the triple therapy's drugs, hydroxychloroquine. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on those results. A new study shows a significant decline in hospitalization rate and deaths in virus patients treated with hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and azithromycin, an antibiotic. From the treated group of 141 people, four were hospitalized and one died. From the untreated group of 377 people, 58 were hospitalized and 13 died. All patients in the study tested positive for the CCP virus. They were also either over 60 years old or had an underlying condition. While all treated patients were prescribed hydroxychloroquine, a small number didn't take zinc or the antibiotic. Dr. Vladimir Zelenko, a doctor who touted the hydroxychloroquine therapy, says there's enough information out there for people to make up their minds about its effectiveness. Because the information is available. I mean, there's an effective treatment. It's cheap. It's $20. It's, av it's available by mouth. We know, we know about these medications for 65 years. Stop the fear-mongering, the false narrative. 
effect. His study comes as the WHO again discontinues its study of hydroxychloroquine. It says the drug produced little or no reduction in the mortality of hospitalized CCP virus patients. Other studies show similar results to Zelenko's, which don't line up with the WHO. A retrospective analysis of COVID-19 patients in Michigan found that hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin alone lowers the death rate. Dr. Zelenko says his study is being peer-reviewed, a process he called corrupt. However, as, you, as we've seen, unfortunately, that the peer review process has become corrupted. Look at the Lancet study. Look at the uh, New York England Journal study that they've been retracted because of fraud. And the WHO used fraudulent studies to set its policies. It has nothing to do with truth anymore. It has to do with political agenda or a false narrative. The FDA revoked the emergency authorization for hydroxychloroquine last month, its chief scientist saying it's unlikely to produce an antiviral effect. But a look into the FDA's review of safety issues shows that zinc was not used in combination with hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. Zelenko says it's zinc that stops the virus from growing. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.